In this video, I'll be discussing some of the study habits that I feel are holding students back in maximizing their performance in school. Do take note that every person is unique, so if any of the techniques I mentioned in this video actually works well for you in real life, then more power to you. With that said, everything I discuss in this video is either based on my personal experiences or based on research that I've done for this video. Now, there's nothing wrong with aiming to get high grades. However, if the pursuit of those high marks comes at the cost of your health, mental health, and your relationships with other people, maybe it's time to take a step back and reconsider why you're trying to achieve those high marks. There's a video I recently came across on the YouTubers Mike and Matty on why Matty no longer tries to ace every single one of his exams. In the video, Matty discusses how peer pressure and the study ground community has created this toxic culture wherein if you see someone studying 10 hours a day to ace their exams or having this aesthetic desk setup where you have multiple highlighters and pens, means that you should have it too. However, the reality is, is that you don't have to follow what they're doing. Ultimately, Matty's point in the video is that in pursuing your own education, the bar should be defined by you and not what by what others do. You should be good enough in your own terms. After listening to this video, I was reminded of the mindset I had when I first started medical school. I remember seeing each of the top 10 students in the upper batches get called on stage, and I was in awe seeing these students who had worked really hard throughout the year and earned the honor of being among the top 10 in their batch. I was so motivated in that moment that I decided that I would try to be among the top 10 in my batch by the end of my first year. However, given that there's no definite grade requirement to be in the top 10, it just basically meant that I would have to try to score as high as I can on every single exam so that I would maintain a high enough average in the hopes that I would be in the top 10 at the end of the year. At first, I enjoyed the challenge. I treated every exam like a video game level where I tried to score as many points as possible to get the high score. However, as time wore on, I started to get fatigued by the amount of time I was really putting into studying the material. I was beginning to lose sleep, neglecting exercise, and just about everything else in my life. Eventually, I began to question myself. Did I really want this goal? Is it something I truly wanted? Or is it something that I just kind of wanted and it would be nice to have? When I took a step back to reflect, I realized that the goal of achieving top 10 in the batch didn't really align with the grander goals I had for myself. What I really wanted to achieve was to achieve my dream residency but still maintain some semblance of a life in med school. Obviously, I would have to still dedicate time to studying, but I wouldn't make my entire life medical school and just being a med student. And given my dream residency at the time was a very competitive specialty like general surgery, it'll help of course to be in the top 10. However, I'd met several alumni who've made it into competitive general residency specialties without ever being in the top 10. So I made a promise to myself that I'd still continue to try to perform well as I could on every exam but I would ease up the pressure to try to score perfect or at least 90% on every single exam. At the end of the year, I didn't achieve a top 10 standing like I had a hope, but I definitely performed good enough for the standards I set for myself. Something I used to do a lot when preparing for my exams from grade school all the way to my days in college was to reread my notes and highlights over and over again. On the days leading up to my exam, I would go over my notes and go over my highlights and reread them every day over and over in the hopes that they would stick and I would remember most of it during the exam. The reason I think I did this a lot and I feel the other reason a lot of people also have this habit is that rereading your notes gives you that sense of familiarity and which makes you feel as if you already understood the material. However, once you go to actually test yourself or answer a question related to the material, suddenly you feel confused and most of the information that you've read over the past hour has just suddenly up and disappeared. This is the reason reading and rereading information is not the most effective way to make information stick. Not only my own experience, but scientifically as well. The reason for this is that as you put information in your head, it will slowly start to decay over time. For example, if you read a chapter in a textbook and it takes you about a day to forget half of the information you read from that chapter, by the second day, you will only remember 25% of the original 100% you read. How you combat this effect is by re-exposing yourself to the information, resetting the forgetting curve, and actually slowing down the rate of the decay, allowing you to remember the information for longer. This is what's known as space repetition, which I've made a completely separate video on discussing the evidence behind it. However, this doesn't completely solve the issue because as we discussed earlier, rereading isn't exactly the best method to review information. So, what is the best way to re-expose yourself to information? Well, my answer to that is active recall. To put it simply, active recall is the act of testing yourself to see if you've learned a piece of information. This can come in the form of flashcards, practice questions, teaching it to other people, and so on. The reason that this method is better than rereading your notes and highlights is that it forces you to think harder about the answer. I liken it to lifting weights. So when you're working on the gym, you want to use a weight that's not too light that it's too easy, but not so heavy that you can't even lift it up. 
You want it somewhere just in the middle where it can provide adequate resistance for optimal muscle growth. An active recall is kind of like that. You're challenging yourself just enough to make those neural connections stronger and make your memory last longer. It may feel uncomfortable at first because we're not used to this amount of effort when actually studying for our exams. And it's something I experience even until now when learning new information. But as you do it more often and correctly, it will slowly become easier and easier to recall the information. And I guarantee that you will see improvements in your exam performances. One of the bad habits I noticed that a lot of students have, including myself, is that we tend to delay the hardest tasks to the very end. For example, if I had to review 10 lectures, I would be more inclined to start with the lectures that have the least amount of pages or lecture slides and leave the longer ones for last. The problem with this strategy is that these shorter lectures or quote unquote the easier lectures are usually the lectures that you are more familiar with and will derive the least benefit from when reviewing. There's this quote from the author Mark Twain where he says, the first thing you do in the morning is to eat a live frog. Then you can go through the rest of the day knowing the worst is behind you. And I think the principle in this quote can be applied also to studying, meaning that you should prioritize studying the hard subjects first. To do this, you have to evaluate if you were to take the exam at this very moment, the questions on the topic that you'd least like to come out are the lectures that you should probably review first. This is something I first learned from Ali Abdal, where the logic behind this technique is that the topics that you are least familiar with are the topics you're most likely to apply active recall on the best since you are least familiar with that and you are more likely to exert more effort to recall the pieces of information. One way to properly apply this technique is to have a tracker of all the lessons you need to study for an exam and rate them according to your familiarity with the lesson. The way I do this is that I have a Google spreadsheet where I list down all the lecture topics and highlight them as green, yellow, or red. Green means that I'm super familiar with the content already, where I know 80 to 90% of it off the top of my head. Yellow means I know the gist of the lecture, but I still need to look at the finer details to further understand it. Red, on the other hand, means that I understand less than half the lecture and definitely need to review it once again. And after I reviewed each topic, I would reevaluate myself on the familiarity, either through flashcards or doing practice questions, or just based on how I felt about it. And that would serve as the basis for scheduling my succeeding reviews afterwards. Now multitasking is something I'm pretty sure that all of us have tried at least once and multitasking is basically trying to do two different things simultaneously. Even I admit that I've caught myself doing something else while listening to a recorded lecture and as much as we'd like to believe that multitasking is a thing, the fact of the matter is, it's not. And what the science reveals is that when you try to multitask, what is actually happening is that your brain is actively switching your focus between the tasks that you're doing. And the result of this divided attention is that you end up making more errors on the task compared to had you just done it completely focused. With that said, when studying, it's important to keep the main thing the main thing. If you have to read a chapter in a book or write an essay, try to set the goal for yourself to work continuously until you finish it or at least until a specific set point. For me, this is where techniques like the Pomodoro method come in very useful. When doing my Anki flashcards, I usually set the normal interval of 25 minutes. When doing readings or research on the other hand, I tend to set the interval for longer, around an hour, since those are the types of tasks that require more time to understand and comprehend what I'm actually doing. I guarantee if you apply this, you'll actually be more productive with your time and actually save more time in the long run because the quality of your work will go up, which will require you to spend less time correcting your mistakes. Now you've probably heard the theory about learning styles wherein some people are best attuned to learning in different modalities. Some people are visual learners where they learn better through images, some people are auditory where they learn better through listening, and some people are kinesthetic where they learn better by doing things. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's no solid evidence to support that there is any one ideal modality for a single person. As discussed in a video from the YouTube channel Veritasium, the reason people believe this is that once they have a perceived notion of how the world works, they will try to frame everything they encounter to fit that belief. So if a person believes that they are a visual learner, if they're shown a visual diagram on how something works and they understand it immediately, it will only serve the confirmation bias in their heads that they learned it well because they are a visual learner and not because that the infographic was just really good to begin with. In reality, the best learning modality depends on the type of information you're trying to learn. For example, in medical school, if you're learning biochemistry, you'll actually benefit from visually seeing the diagrams of the different metabolic pathways so you understand each step in the pathway. 
But contrast that with trying to learn how to take a history in PE, you're actually better off learning from actually doing the history in PE so that you can understand each individual step. So since it's something that you'll actually have to practice once you're in the hospital. So if the science shows that no single learning modality improves our ability to learn information, then what does? What the research shows that using multimodal approaches to learning is of great help. A great example of this are all the educational videos you see on YouTube. In these videos, the teacher explains the concepts, but they more often than not have visual aids so that you can better understand what they're trying to explain. In my personal experience, these types of videos have helped me in understanding anatomy better by showing me where the muscle is and what it looks like when the muscle is extended and when the muscle is flexed. Ultimately, the most important thing in learning is not your learning style, but how you process the information. Like I said earlier in the video, the more effort you put in trying to remember and to understand the information you're trying to learn, the more likely you are to learn from it and make it stick. And if you want to learn more about the effective study habits that I use as a medical student, check out this video here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.